We are undoubtedly in a period of crisis, a global crisis, what I see it as, and I think many other people do also, a spiritual crisis. It's a crisis of awakening. I would explain an awakening as a profound shift from a sense of who we were into something that is more expanded. First of all, mainstream science, up till now really, but it is changing, has described physical reality in terms of its appearance. Appearance of separation, an appearance of, of the physical or our universe being so materialistic. And essentially that's wrong. Whilst its appearance is of separation, actually our universe is innately unified. There is no me and you separate from each other. There is no me separate from our planetary home or you separate from a star light years away. We're ultimately all part of a universe that literally exists and evolves as the unified entity. If we can actually realize that reality is truly unified, then perhaps another question we ask is why the pandemic? Why now? What's it trying to tell us? With all its challenges, with all its tragedies, with all its difficulties, with all its pain. Any crisis is a potential moment of transformation. What we know from wisdom paths is they're pretty unanimous in saying that crisis brings opportunity and it requires that we break through our ego boundaries that become solidified and ossified over time and through the cracks the possibility of something you can emerge their sense of self that we all have built up over a lifetime since we were born that places us as separate from the whole in our language in the way we believe that gets dismantled in one of these crises that all tribal contexts of initiation that have mapped out the personal and spiritual journey starts with the process of separation. You can turn to a lot of the traditional practices where how can you see this moment of solitude as an opportunity to really get to know yourself? Sometimes the initiate would spend months in isolation um, waiting for the great dream. They would go into the woods on purpose and isolate themselves on purpose in order to get more clarity in themselves. And the great dream would be sent from the gods and it would tell them where they should exist as an adult in their societies. Just about every culture I've been in, every small tribal or small indigenous culture has somebody that goes into an altered state to act as a healer or a visionary for their group. And they're usually chosen by having a crisis. It's a crisis, yes, but it, like any crisis, brings about an opportunity. However, challenging circumstances sometimes have been. It's those circumstances that I learn from. So I see this special time we are living in, in a way also as a wake up call to understand on a deeper consciousness level, what a single person 
or we as a community, or we as a nation, or we as a world community, what we create. And my sense is that perhaps we can, instead of seeing it as a crisis to be overcome, and then go back to the old normal, which was unsustainable, might we not use a metaphor from nature of metamorphosis? And I say this time, this is probably the simplest metaphor as a metamorphosis, you know, the caterpillar that moves into its little cocoon and it gets smashed up into smudgy pieces. And in that chrysalis, the caterpillar itself dissolves. It becomes totally liquid. And right now, this is a liquid moment. I heard somebody say that recently and I thought, wow, that's a beautiful way of putting it. This is a liquid moment and anything can happen. The alchemical map of transformation, which was at first mapped out by alchemists, it was then psychologized by Jung. It would start from the stage of Negredo, which is associated with a, with a black color. And this is a, a stage of suffering and darkness. It's a state of confusion. And it's a time where old forms dissolve and everything sort of comes into questioning. So nothing can be taken for granted. Even though it's a very despairing state, it is only through this chaos that transformation can only really emerge from. So it's, a, it's a really an essential part. A crisis is an interregnum, a space between two regimes, a space between two forms of order. So it's a difficult intermediary space. But for transformative learning, that is when it happens. And yet this in-between, very uncomfortable phase of the great unknown is also the seat of unlimited possibility. So imagine this as an incubation phase. Imagine this as a pregnancy. We are germinating a seed. It's gone down into the deep earth and we're watering and we're tending to it, but it hasn't really met with the world. It exists purely in a becoming phase, in a phase of potential. The first key phase is coping with the crisis, getting through it as best we can, staying safe. Our body is built to hijack our cognitive mind in times of stress. So we will naturally become either more shut down or more vigilant. So first and foremost, I'd suggest to someone who's feeling the fear, don't try and deny it. Don't try and run from it. A key initial step is acknowledging that we don't know. We don't even know what is happening during the crisis. In that not knowing, there can be fear. So how can you relax that? And how can you support people to be in the not knowing and just say, that's okay? We have to meet it and engage with it rather than somehow try to fall back into our old comforts and our old dependencies. One of the ways that can help is to just stop, stop whatever you're doing and take some deep breaths. Simple as that, as simple as that. We just have to stop, you know? Sit for a moment or sit at a tree or go in the nature, you know, what, whatever serves you to slow down, to be in the moment, in presence. Well, I think the first part is really about holding ourselves in trust so that you can be present and that you can be in a state of 
of, um, of trusting life. And that doesn't mean that you don't need to feel the fear, but the fear is not taking over. So when that calmness, when that feeling of peace emerges, then to focus on what it is that we love. What are we grateful for? That makes it already possible for you to come more into your heart. Whatever your worldview is, doesn't matter. That already happens. And to come into parts of your brain that are not being focused on stress or fight, flight, freeze, but perhaps can let you relax so that you can access something else in yourself. This is where the mindfulness comes in, in terms of watching how the fear is impacting on us and being able to kind of distance ourselves a little bit, step back a little bit from it. You know, we're not our thoughts, we're not our emotions. Also normal in a time like this to feel overwhelmed that way. So the more you can move into mindfulness, which is embodied tasks, doing some yoga, going for walks, coloring, doing some crafts, things that bring you into the moment and paying attention to what you actually see, what you actually hear, what you actually feel, will start allowing your nervous system to calm down and you might recognize that there's space here to do work in this stillness, but that it's also okay for that to sometimes be challenging and difficult because it is. I think really the work at the moment is what the unions would call shadow work. Trauma is felt and stored in the body and it's forever seeking a way to be released and a way to be voiced. This old suppressed pain is just wanting to be heard. The shadow in Jungian analytic psychology are all the aspects of the self that we have denounced, the things that we are and we think we're not. We have to embrace our emotions fully in order to integrate that fragmented part of ourselves, in order to truly have compassion for ourselves and for another. This is old trauma that is wanting to be released and if we project it onto another then we're just perpetuating the same cycle. And we can only hold space for another person at the depth that we have gone to within ourselves. Doing this deep work expands our capacity to be compassionate to another's healing. I'm very much into creating safe spaces where people can authentically speak from their hearts to be able to voice all your emotions. Where people are supported to be able to have a time out and to reflect on their life and connect with themselves. And so how to create an environment that's open and uh, inviting Find someone who you know you can be true with that isn't going to judge your emotions as something that needs to be bypassed or transcended. You provide maximal freedom, but within a container of maximal safety. So if we were to be able to create a space and have different kinds of experiences that would allow the human being to begin to imagine what is it within them that they could change. But the benefits both for ourselves and for the world as a whole are potentially paradigm shifting. And just like an individual who hits rock bottom, uh, the coronavirus may just well be that, you know, that, that extra straw that breaks the camel's back, if you like. Because the pandemic stopped us in our tracks with all its tragedies and challenges, it's also, I feel, offering us an opportunity to reflect, to go within. To allow us collectively to make different choices, 
to make different decisions, to come out of our uh, dark night of the soul, to come out of this crisis moment and into a positive new future. Well, that's not going to be easy. So really, this is the process of confronting ourselves and really asking who are we? Beyond the illusions of who we think we are, beyond the illusions of the very sanitized persona. And what will get us through this, in my view, is not fear, it's love. If we can see it as an opportunity, then we can harness the gifts of the healing and the growth, of the kind of resolving the, the underlying trauma, of working with the shadow material, of, of kind of really growing and, and stepping more fully into, into who we're meant to be, you know, in terms of what we have to offer the world. <laughs> oh goodness every time I watch I've seen it so many times and every time I watch it I see layers and layers of more of more stuff um so as you may have um noticed we were trying to really capture this this kind of reflection of what goes on on an individual micro level in the meta in the in the global perspective and um, there's so many kind of strands we could pick on to pick up to to talk to talk about here but um, we really want these projects to be like a polyphony of voices for everybody to to contribute and us to listen um, so I'm just I'm just noticing the comments as well Coco who's in the film just yeah we're, we're just I think for me, I always learn. I'm always learning every time I watch this. I'm in a new place within myself. And something I really picked up from that was, was Aftab talking about the interreg interregnum space. And it feels like we're in that space as a, as a species at the moment. We're in this suspense of everything falling away and we, we don't know what's, what's emerging. And I'm absolutely in that space myself at the moment. I'm just wondering if anybody would particularly like to say anything resonates with anything in particular has any comments or questions before we go to the second film Krista? Krista did you want to say something? It's interesting that you said emerging um, I listened to it of an aboriginal um, person in a way from Australia not long ago and he said something which really resonated with me and put me at ease. He said things are much too complex and complicated uh, for us to know the outcome and all we can do is facilitate spaces where this reality, this new reality can emerge and our job is to create the spaces rather than and the environment rather than thinking this is the goal and I need to like mad work towards it because we cannot know because we're in such a transformation and for me that was really fantastic and it's just because you just said the word emerge 
I wanted to add this and there's quite a bit of um, mm -hmm. uh, questions on the chat so I click out thank you Krista yeah absolutely absolutely I yeah totally totally hearing that um Steve there seems to be people needing or recognizing change did you want to did you want to speak did you want to say it <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah thank you yourself. thank you thanks Katie yeah um I'm just wondering if there's there seems to be such a lot of people that I'm aware of different groups and things that are aware of these changes that you spoken to in the movie um in the you know in the clip there um and i'm i'm sometimes i think is it just because i'm already interested in this sort of thing or or is it really something that seems to be expanding you know i mean i hope it is and mm. how do we take this out to people who, who are maybe not aware yeah yeah it's a it's a great comment and i think you know one of the things we were trying to do is make these films accessible to people that maybe were on the periphery of that and quit starting to question things and hopefully hopefully it does kind of speak to the non-converted as well but Samir I don't know if you want to say anything about yeah. that. Uh, thank you for your question Steve. I think um, when, when the Covid crisis hit one of the thoughts we had was that um, people here on the periphery would have time now because of lockdown and because of other factors just to sit and think and be on their own, which is quite a unique opportunity. And whether they had a, a good or a bad time during that lockdown, they would have had to face some of their fears and face some of their life choices. And, and that would have sparked either a crisis or questioning. And so the film was almost an opening to allow them to, to, to explore those questions. So the suggestion is, um, there is a change happening, uh, something unique is going on. And if you do have questions about what is going on and, and, and where it could be going, you know, here is just a, a, a guide, a very light guide. And, and, and what we hope to do uh, with our sessions and perhaps with more content is, is guide them deeper into it. It's, it's more like an introduction. But many people could watch this and say, well, I, I already know all of this stuff because they're already, they're already in that journey. So it is meant to be an introduction to it rather than a detailed exploration. It's interesting you say that, Samir, though, because I um, am I interrupting you? Have you finished? No. Sorry. <laughs> Just I'm really recognizing my own journey and the, the deeper I go, the more the more I, the, the different parts speak to me in the films. So I'm going through another stage of what feels like a liquid moment at the moment. And I kind of heard it in a different way. Um, it feels like this. We kind of obviously there's this spiral that we revisit and and learn lessons. Um, I don't know whether anybody else um, recognizes that or resonates with that. Zach, I just just in answer to your question, thank you for the comment. Um, and uh, yeah, the people speaking are the contributors named at the end. So after each short, we have a list of contributors who are who are the voices. But I think. Samir, it was kind of, it was your decision, wasn't it, not to make a talking head film? Yeah, um, so uh, I've, um, I've always liked the, the documentary films of this guy called Asif Kapadia, who did Senna, and he did um, the Amy Winehouse film. And he makes his films without any talking heads. He just uses footage, so it's just a visual journey. And um, that's one reason I wanted to see whether it could work without any talking heads. And the other reason was, was to almost create a, a collective voice. So, it, and, and not to identify one single person, just to feel that there's an ongoing conversation happening with multiple people and who knows who they are. They do happen to be people with some credibility, but I didn't think that was so important. I didn't, I didn't want people to know who they were. I just wanted to feel, to feel the voices and to feel them, um, it's almost, almost like a song or like harmony so it's meant to be an experience but you don't have to identify with any of the people who are speaking i also want to say thank you to coco who's actually on the call and she's one of the contributors as well as krista and katie um but but we i just credit them at the end yeah it was kind of the idea was kind of to have an orchestra of voices because this is this is happening to all of us whoever we are um it doesn't really matter, as you, as you said to me, it doesn't matter who we are. Coco, I'm so glad you have your hand up. I was going to ask you to speak, but I didn't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Please do. 
<laughs> You're mute. Oh, do you want me to speak now? Okay. Yeah, I just really wanted to echo what you were saying about the spiraling effect and the layers that we move through when we go through these metamorphosis and, and transformational periods. Um, like yourself, I'm in another liquid um, unravelling moment and listening to the film again, see it in a whole completely new, different way, in a way that's just so ignited my spirit because I think initially when we go through these processes, it does feel like an absolute crisis. Mm. And as we move through the layers and go through the spiral, each time we come back to this kind of like liminal liquid space, yeah. for me this time round, it's been so enlightening and um, transformational in a way where it's catapulted me into the truth of who I am as a being. And I think that's where we're kind of moving to. So in answer to someone's question about can people, do all people go through this change? I think actively we are all going through this change. And just as I'm hearing this differently this time round, people will initially take the grains of sand that they need to take from it because that's what it is. It's like a seed or a grain of sand that slowly unlocks keys within you um, because there were so many things in that film and I've watched it about seven times that I heard for the first time and I was like wow how did I miss all that and it's because I'm in a different open space and can take in all the information so I see this um, more so as everybody's going to be on this side, on this journey. We're evolving as a planet, as a species. So um, all who need to hear the message will hear the message in their own time. Um, so yeah. yeah. Thank you, Coco. I think, I think how you've described that as well, it actually links to Mary your question about the kaleidoscope, the mandala kind of effects, because Samir, I think you're, this was your, kind of um, design choice and I wonder whether you could answer that and then we could go maybe to the second film because I'm I know that once we get into discussions this the time just flies so <laughs> keeping an eye on the time yeah so do you want me to reply to that question if you don't mind that'd be great yeah um so uh uh my spiritual awakening experience is uh, called Kundalini and I've had experiences which I wouldn't say are visually exactly like a kaleidoscope, but there's a sense of symmetry. Sometimes when I've had some of the more cosmic experiences and the best way I can describe it is a kaleidoscope effect. Um, and, and after I had a continuing experience, I became obsessed with mandalas and I started working with painters to make different various mandalas. So it's something that just has settled in me a way to convey a message is to work with the mandala or kaleidoscope effect. And uh, I work in eights. Uh, eights for me is a very important number. So all the mandalas have eight, eight, five, or eight points. Uh, and I can't really explain more than it's just something that keeps coming back to me to work with mandalas and, and visual kaleidoscopes. This makes sense symmetrically. So it's more of an intuition and a heartfelt expression of, of an experience rather than an, an intellectual choice. It just felt right. Thank you, Samir. Um, sorry, with um, Stephanie. Stephanie has your have your hand up. Sorry, I didn't see you before. Does that would you like to say anything now before we go to the next film? Thank you, because today I was just questioning. Maybe am I spending too much alone? Or the lockdown is over here? It was just uh, an answer at the right time for me. This film to remind me to keep. Going. And uh, I think this film, it's so important also for other people to show them the other perspective from the pandemic or how you can take these things for, for your own benefit. Mm. Thank you. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Really, really pleased you've landed here. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I'm not very good at multitasking. Annabelle, you also uh, wanted to. If anybody's feeling the urge to speak, feel please feel free to unmute yourself and kind of mention the fact if I haven't seen you because uh, yeah, it's a shared space. <laughs> You're on mute. Sorry, Annabelle, you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Yeah, no, I, just, I don't want to say very much, just simply that what came across to me in the film was this sense of slow motion. And I think that was really enhanced by the music and the, um, just the way the voices came in. And I found that very, very powerful for this liminal space, this sort of slow motion. I just wanted to say how much that impacted me was that. So yeah, that was very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a while to see <laughs> see you. Um, okay, so would anybody else like to say anything before we go to the second film? Anybody I've missed? Please do feel free to shout. Okay. Yes, oh, Should we go for the okay. second yep, yep, yep. round two? Yep. <laughs> Finding your purpose, finding your authentic contribution in whatever ways that is, and then living it with all your heart is the single greatest call to action. It's the single greatest call to action. It's about becoming action. It's about becoming one with what we do. It's the way what you think, how you use your words, how you live your life with action. The call to action is to use that impulse to do something impulse towards our best selves and to share that and share that with others. This is the time to take a stand. This is so at this moment in time, I think we are all called to I think we are find out to what we actually want to see in the world when this is all over. We want to see in the world. The second key phase is actually making sense of it. What was it that was coming up from the unconscious to be healed? What, what trauma and wounding was coming up to the surface? What to the surface? Once the initiate, the alchemist, was able to successfully navigate the challenges of the Negredo, the, the dark night of the show, successfully, then that would be the way to the Albedo. Successfully, the Albedo is the state associated with the white coin. The Negredo is the state. The Negredo is about meeting the shadow and working through all of that. But the Albedo is where you're integrating the opposite. The Albedo is where you. And in the Albedo state, new insights about the situation are starting. Starting to emerge, the situation or starting. So there's a disintegration followed by a reorganization and a renewal. There's a, an opening to an understanding of the purpose, the wider purpose. For each individual, I think it is really about widening the horizon, seeing the bigger picture and one's own part in it. So what was the crisis about? What have I learned in the crisis? What wasn't there in the crisis which could have helped me? And these are things that point you in the direction what you can do outside afterwards.
sacred activism it means doing that deep inner work finding our best conscious selves and using that energy to take political action to take social action to put inner ethics into action and to make changes in the world I think the inner and the outer are important because there's a link of authenticity between our inner experiences and how we then go out in the world and what we do. The most important thing is a person recognizing who they are and why are they here and what do they bring and then adapting that to what's outside of themselves. In the outer work in the world, it's about reveal thyself, but revealing what's true to the inner work that we're doing. How can I lessen the gap? And the gap between the inner truth and the outside expression. There's really only one solution, connecting to our hearts and our values and asking the question, you know, where do my personal values meet the world's needs? The collective awakening has to be almost a quantum leap in consciousness that we begin to understand ourselves as part of a much bigger whole. This is the time to take our responsibility for how we exist in the world and how we exist in our small world and how we exist in the bigger wider world. All the scientific discovery is really validating what we are already doing and what we already knew and how important it is for us to stay connected to one another for mental health and also to stay connected to the planet. Where instead of our worlds being focused around what's good for me, we start thinking about what's good for the whole. Take the time to understand that we are one humanity and this is possible if we take responsibility for change. Our mindsets are where we are locked down in perspectives. And so we need to develop a whole other level of perspectival capability individually and collectively to even let in observations that we're not able to share yet. The minute you experience the other's experience and then you look at how it connects to you, you, you give up judgment and yet you feel united. And unity without judgment is love. And that means having different kind of conversation. Conversations that are not locked down in opinions and perspectives. It's an entire shift in our relationship to perspectives. It's the ability to release your own sense of who you are and what you believe and think and need so that you can experience the other as who they are. To take some time listening to different perspectives and letting those affect us. If we don't let them affect us, there's not even the beginnings of the process of being able to integrate it. Which is why I say I really advocate having to swallow your pride, having to suspend your beliefs and just listen. 
you put yourself in a position of someone that you do judge. If you're able to put yourself in those positions, it's good to ask how many of us would do differently. And with sufficient practice, especially enhanced by doing this together and in teams and organizations and communities, a whole new kind of capability emerges. And these practices help us to see a larger part of the reality, to be able to shift to see somebody else's view and reality. Where our perspectival capability is enhanced by what we could call post-perspectival and post-cultural consciousness. That is often a dimension of what we call spiritual awakening. Then out of that come up with uh, creative ideas, what we could be manifesting together, which would give us all an opportunity to express ourselves and to create something together. And this post-perspectival consciousness, post-cultural consciousness, enables a whole other kind of conversation and a whole other kind of collective action emerging from such conversations. Healing and reconciliation are core to answering the call. As long as we don't heal, we stay reactive in our actions and decisions. Healing to me means the process of integrating pain and trauma in a way that cuts reactive bonds. To come to a point where the past doesn't hold us, but informs the present and the future in a way that serves our evolution. It's so relevant and poignant at this time to understand that ancestral healing is an essential part of our collective evolution. When we look at ancestral trauma or our ancestral lineage, we sometimes can look at it in a narrow way. It's not just a physiology that's passed down. Trauma is passed down and our gifts are passed down. We're just learning about generational trauma in a scientific state. Now, there's been experiments with rats where they shock them and give them a certain smell, like a Pavlovian dog. They go into a total fear state. And on that fifth generation, they introduce that smell again to those rats and they go into that fear state. So they're looking at epigenetics as the cause of that. And the point is we're all human beings and we all have certain histories. And if you look at all the genocides and the wars, people are suffering. So how do we go beyond suffering into a place of equity and peace and joy and understanding and connectivity? By doing just some research around your own ancestral line and start from home, ask if your parents are still alive, ask about their childhood, ask about what their life was like for them and if they can recall what life was like for their parents also. It's a process. You don't just do one exercise and it's all done ancestral lines are important, the healing is important, it does get passed on to us and quite often we don't know if what we actually feel and experience is our own or if it has been passed on through the line. Embracing the history and story of ancestral trauma for me wasn't necessarily just my own individual story and path. I'm doing it as part of the collective healing.
An important part of the healing process is finding ways to express our wounds and trauma. And creativity and all kinds of art can help us to do so. You can explore through painting, through drawing, through dancing. You just do it with an intent. The unspoken can surface in the creative process and find expression. Art can bridge the divide caused by traumatic experiences. Entering into mindfulness means entering into embodied states. Most people who went through trauma go out of their bodies. And so the more embodied practices you have, it's like a natural means of entering into mindfulness. And many indigenous cultures know much more about this than our culture does. And they often put creative and mostly embodied practice at the center of their rituals. Music has a big part to play in our collective healing, and so does movement. Rhythm has been shown, collective drumming has been shown to induce trance. We know that when people dance together, they go into trance states together. Spontaneous movement will naturally release trauma. It brings them back into their bodies. Purpose is not a thing. Our purpose is to be love, if there's a purpose to anything in life. And whatever way you can express love, whether that's through art, dance, movement, writing, speaking, begin somewhere, but always begin from a place of love. I believe that everyone's given a mission, given a purpose, given something that's theirs to do. And I think the best thing you can do for the planet is to really find out what that is and to follow it with all of your heart. Allow life to show what it can bring us and that it's a miracle and we follow our steps where they take us. And when you feel that, it's intuition, it's guidance, it's etc. But it allows one to follow one's footsteps. And as we care for each other and love each other and remember our love for each other, and hopefully for our Mother Earth and all her children, then that can be part of the healing process on not just an outward level, but an inner level. And that can be helpful in helping us to heal our collective dis-ease of the illusion, the separation. Thank you, Samir. Um, just wondering before I launch into uh, a, a topic about about the second film, if anybody's feeling called to respond or say anything. Jenny, hi, Jenny. Nice to see you. Hi, Katie. <laughs> hi, everyone. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to that. Um, so much of the second um, film has really resonated with me. 
I've been working personally on ancestral healing since the 90s. And over the last 18 months, I've come to realize that I've also been working for the collective. So that really resonated, everything that was said in there, I could really feel that and, and I know that there, there are shifts happening everywhere. And it is just about helping other people to, um, just helping with the understanding. So these films are brilliant. And also the love, love is everything. Love is why we're here. Love is, just is, <laughs> it's the be all and end all. Well, thank you, thank you. Everybody. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, you know, I was thinking when I was listening to that again about the one of the things that we've been talking about within the team and within sort of developing the vision, the third film, which we'll talk a bit about, is 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 this idea of the feedback loop is when we when we experience the awakening, having this this passion and urgency to create change. But often what we can forget along that journey is to kind of is to turn that like within and do the inner work as well. I know I've been absolutely guilty of that, sort of trying to plough on with what I want to do to make the world a better place. And um, and actually I've, I come back to realising that the, the, mo the, the biggest responsibility I have and the best work I can do is, is to heal myself and my own wounds. Um, to be the best the best person I can be and it's it just it feels like it gets harder and harder <laughs> my awakening was like 10 years ago now and uh, yeah it's it's uh, it, it's just layers and layers and layers isn't there but absolutely and I think that love that you mentioned Jenny it's like remembering to turn that in on ourselves so yeah absolutely absolutely and and this last 18 months has been a gift an absolute gift mm. A, pain, painful, a painful painful blessing yeah, yeah. absolutely um so i'm just see, seeing some comments on the chats if anybody want if, if anybody would like to to say anything please feel free to unmute yourself um i'm not very good at following the chats <laughs> um some of the comments have uh, disappeared um laura you, you did you want to say anything or no absolutely fine if if you prefer to not speak obviously but hi Laura <laughs> hi can you hear me okay you're quite quiet but oh but I, okay sorry I, I'm closer <laughs> can you hear can you hear me yeah we can hear you okay um well thank you I just I'm so I feel so privileged to be part of the um of this group and to be able to do these amazing they're extraordinary uh, videos and so desperately needed in this world. I, I mean, I, I'll tell you all that um, I'm coming from a journey that is incredibly lengthy, as Judy knows, um, up through uh, Christianity and um, the layers of trying to um, come to a place where uh, my value system could uh, work uh, cohesively with um, with a Christian framework has been extraordinarily difficult um, because I don't believe uh, that God loves any group of people more than any other. And so um, through my own awakening, uh, I have found that that is absolute truth, that uh, God does indeed uh, love everyone equally and that we are working toward um, an, ev it's an evolution process of, of truly coming together to um, heal all divides. And, uh, from within, and that inner work that you were mentioning earlier, so paramount to being able to break down really stunting, um, paralyzing, uh, and very divisive uh, barriers and paradigms of brokenness and and uh, self righteousness and um, all sorts of uh, really ugly things mm -hmm. um, that we have been culturally conditioned to believe. So anyway, and I have a lot more that I could add, but I don't want to. Um, I was just going to stay quiet. Mm, I, thank I, you, Laura. Yeah. yeah, I really, I really hear hear in what you're saying as well, like the the fear, the the divisiveness that happens because of fear. You know that so much kind of fundamentalist beliefs because this, everybody is so tightly holding on to like this this one perspective is the right perspective and actually 
yeah it's really hard to kind of it puts us in a really vulnerable position to go actually I might be wrong and and um and and question our question our lens question what what lens am I coming to this situation with because of my history and my culture and my wounding so yeah thank you for thank you for that comment um hi oh oh sorry it's okay Laura to carry on I'll okay. stick with it that that narrow-minded perspective is really what is so incredibly damaging to all of us and keep us all in these boxes and you know the, with these labels and uh you know, just, uh, the more we can have a broader perspective, like you're saying, and take that lens out further and further, and we can see that ripple effect of all of our thoughts, words, and actions that is profoundly uh, more significant than I think any of us have any clue about. Mm, absolutely. Societal, political, educational health changes. I mean, I know, you know, you, we, we have a shared passion in, in mental health system, seeing things through a much much broader lens and yeah so yeah this I mean this is kind of what what, what our aim for the third film is the vision is, is what what could the world look like if everybody goes through this experience and and we we really own this process so um sorry I'm jumping ahead um Coco you wanted to say something um yeah just the just talking again about the inner process because ultimately it is an inner process um, and which is why it's really important that we begin to create these spaces where people can drop into the depth of their being to speak about everything that they're holding within because it is quite confronting to face the inner when we've been taught to be so outwardly focused in our culture and society. Um, but as you said earlier, Katie, um, it's always about turning back in on oneself and we need um, guides to be able to do that or examples of people who have done that um, so that we can see that although it's confronting, it's a very, very necessary step. It's the, the key to transforming, not just personally or individually, but on a collective and planetary level as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're talking about the vision forward, I know that's my path now completely to create those spaces and to hold space to people to drop into that depth of emotion mm. um and i believe this is what this like cycle that i've been in um over the last um few months has been about because i've really had to face my biggest core wound um and hold kind of a space for that um with loving support um and the joy and sense of sovereignty and um feeling of liberation and freedom on the other side of that is worth the traveling through the dark night of the soul and tunnel to get mm. there and yeah it yeah. takes some it takes somebody actually reminding you of that when you're in it though doesn't it because it is such yeah a pain and that's us. yeah and that's why it's like when we get to the other side i'm just realizing how important it is to speak about the journey mm -hmm. so that others can know that it's it's confronting mm -hmm. and at times it feels terrifying and show but, up when yeah. we're in those when we're in those places like you know stephanie mentioned today i'm so grateful that you know it's it's it takes bravery to show up and and yeah. i've got to be honest I, I i had an impulse to run and not show up today because i'm struggling i'm really struggling at the moment but actually when i do i know that it feels safe in these spaces to mm -hmm. it's oxygenating to be able to talk about this stuff and then that eases things yeah um because I think it's being out there and feeling misunderstood and 
and yeah going kind of feeling like we're swimming against the flow sometimes it feels so lonely at times so I think showing up in these spaces and speaking mm. like we are in this way is it, it's helpful for, for to know that we're not alone yeah. Annabelle I've noticed you've had your hand up for a while Did it, it, And it's on this whole um, subject of listening um, that really strikes me in the film that we've just seen and how absolutely near impossible it's to do that on social media, mm. which to me is why it's such a terrifying place to be. I mean, I've had a couple of experiences recently where, yeah, and it's been shocking, really, the, the sort of vitriolic response to a very, um, I can't think of the right word, but a, a very sort of, in a way, heart-filled comment is, is like ripped apart sometimes and it's uh this i think we need to get back to sitting in circle uh, something about physically being present on the ground and re and then you can really hear other people i feel i feel that is the only way to do it properly and i don't know if i'm being sort of making a sweeping statement but it does feel having sat in a lot of circles the depth you just do drop into a huge depth that you just can't possibly in certainly not on social media not by any means so yeah, yeah. yeah. i think it's easier for people to project isn't it and, and anger um on social media and i think you're right it's like the, the connection with with it's grounding isn't it it's like the connection with nature as well if we're sitting on the ground in circle it's a whole different experience suzanne i'm getting a little bit better at this <laughs> <laughs> no. I just felt moved to speak after you know what you were saying about you know showing up and you know I, I work alongside a like midwifing process for with folk and whatever and out out on the land and whatnot and I never really advertised but something moved me to just put it out there last year and that was the amount of people over the past two years who were saying we're just in the street or people that you know were jumping over the 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 lock gates of, of lockdown to, to, because we needed to communicate with each other and saying that they had so much to, to say but were too scared to speak and it was the fear that made me put it out there you know and and just to put just to say come on we need we need to speak we need to communicate and there are these safe spaces you know that we create and that we create in between ourselves and it's not just to be heard and to speak it's witness mm -hmm. i think and the the sort of sense of you know the sort of mycelium which is a word that's really come into our language i think in you know in the past sort of couple of years or so you know we are the mycelium as well and to have all these groups you know and and just people not waiting to be facilitated but just gathering and like a number of people are saying to me on the ground and to me around the fire pit and around the bowl of soup and all the rest of it you know and it is happening there's you know there's just more and more of this going on you know and i, I think I, I felt because i don't often do a lot of speaking i sort of tend to, to sort of hold back but i'm hearing a lot of sort of where the, the pain of people feeling that they're alone and i just wanted to say you know you're not we're not you know, there are, this is happening all over now, you mm. know, and just, yeah, just to, I think trust is a big word. I think that, you know, I don't hear a lot of, but it feels like this is what's really needed. Trust in, you know, the earth's process and ourselves as intrinsic in the earth, you know, trust that process. But mm. it's about the reference, the reference, I think, rather than outside authority, it's about listening that like you were saying Coco deep you know it's inner but at the point where inner is outer you know where it's universal and we all we're all in that mm -hmm. it's just reaching out and yeah just reaching out to each other mm, so good to hear you speak Suzanne I know you normally do so <laughs> quiet and uh, just to hear that you've you've made that offering is is wonderful because it's so needed and I think sometimes our biggest block is ourselves our belief in ourselves in actually doing it um, yeah but yeah. Uh, yeah that's been my bit my strand of journey you know of, like mm -hmm. showing up and, and getting out there like mick was saying you're know, getting out there and being seen mm -hmm. you know I've, I've had some yeah i've had some very really special help to do that lately too <laughs> yeah. anyway yeah thank you no, thank, thank you so much mm. anyone else 
for me, I just wondered if you wanted to say anything about um, the inner and outer, the feedback loop we've been talking about. Um, actually, uh, uh, I do, but... Um, or anything else, sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, I haven't watched the films for a couple of months. I mean, maybe even since the start of the year. So like you, I've had a, a different, different reaction to watching it this time, even though I made them. I think I forgot what's in them. So it's nice to see them. And I feel like a wiser me made them. So I, I kind of learned from watching it. And uh, one of the things that, that uh, stuck out for me with the call is this idea of different perspectives and how important it is in the next few years for people to move out of their own perspectives, to move from the idea that there's an objective reality to the idea that there's many subjective realities and that we need to share our, our perspectives and embrace each other. And that is an awakening. And I think the, the Mandala vision is this idea of people coming together from opposite sides around a central point and sharing uh, a bigger vision of the future where they realize that their perspective was fairly dualistic in nature and that there's a more non-dual reality out there that requires us to let go of who we are and to embrace embrace other ideas and then the other thought i had was this idea of a liquid moment from the first film i i believe in my my belief is i think the more natural state of humanity is an ongoing liquid moment where we don't we're not fixated about a perspective that we begin to understand that perspectives can, can move around and we embrace them in that moment. And so going from, going from one space to another space through a liquid moment, I would say that we should just embrace the, the liquid nature of reality and realize that we're not fixed. Uh, you know, we're, we are empty, like in the Buddhist state. You know, there, there is, everything is conditioned around this reality on each other. We're, we're all sharing something, we're a bigger, we're bigger than we, what we believe, and so perspective holds us back. Um, so I forgot, I forgot all about that when I, when I, was, when I was watching it. I thought that, that's actually a really important point. And then I guess the idea of the inner and the outer is, is very, very important. Um, the inner work for me is probably the more important, but it does go with the outer work. But you can't do the outer work until you do, you know, a couple of years of inner work, I'd say, or, or at least a lot of inner work. And I think that that relationship between the inner and the outer is going to be uh, a very important part of, of our collective awakening. It's how do we deal with our own inner processes and how do we relate to ourselves? And if we can relate to ourselves with love and with equanimity, then we can relate to others with that. But if we can't relate to ourselves with love and equanimity, then how can we relate to others? And it's very difficult to do that. It's not easy. But I feel that that's probably. So at least in my journey, it's a very important part. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Steve, no problem. Nice to see you. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, Marianne's had a hand up for a while. Crystal, did you want to, did you want to say anything urgent? No, no, Marianne, go first, go first. Well, I just wanted to follow on to what Samir had to say because I was moved by the very first scene of the film because it was a bird's eye view from above. And I feel like part of going inside and is, is discovering the universal and being able to get the eagle's eye view that we are part of the larger picture. So I just wanted to sort of echo what Samir had said and I think I see it in his film. So it's beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Should I come in? Okay. Um, it's interesting, Marianne, when I said you go first, because I had something similar to say. Um, I wanted to make two remarks about the inner and the outer. We need to be very careful that we are not falling into dualism here again. We have a very much focus on, um, or now I use 20 years to heal myself inside and I go out. I, I do feel that there might be something to be had to look at this, that the inner um, affects the outer and the outer affects the inner. 
So, and I bring you one example we know from, uh, I, I worked for a long time as a psychologist, as a tra um, complex trauma specialist. Um, and we know from um, um, statistics in Gaza, for example, that the highest trauma level is in children and young people who are not allowed or prevented to fight back. And that we have the lowest levels of trauma, <clears throat> funnily enough, in teenage boys who go out there with stones against the tanks. And this is, of course, because we are doing something, so we are not slipping into complete hopelessness and helplessness. So um, coming from the end where I come from, of course, I'm all for inner, for inner work, of course, and it's a long process for everybody. But I think we should not underestimate how healing it actually also is if we step out of the feeling of we can't do anything here and start doing something because it feeds into our inner healing process. I think what's to be avoided, as Katie said, that we go for let's go, 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 do, 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 and then suddenly realize Blimey, you know, we have ourselves so neglected and we're such a mess inside that all our doing creates nothing else than mess. But to just say, as so many do in Western societies, that it's enough to do 20 years of inner work, I don't quite subscribe to it. I think it has to become a, fee a loop in the end. The inner reflects the outer, but the outer, what we do outside also will contribute to our healing process. All the indigenous people which are now on the streets all over the world, this is part of their healing, is to be out there and, and, and say, no more. No. Mm -hmm. so, so I really think it's, it's both. That's all I wanted to say so that we are not falling too much into it's just inside. It is also what we do. This is this purpose idea. Mm, absolutely. That we all need a bit of purpose, I think. Mm. That's me finished. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, such an important point. I think it absolutely it's integral part of the healing process is to feel to feel worthy, to feel like we are we we have a purpose and um, a reason to be alive. It's that's something that's kept me alive and um, it is doing this work. So, um, yeah, the feedback loop is it's about continuously returning, I think, to self reflect and then and then uh, and then doing the outer work. So, yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to trying to get at, really. But you said it beautifully. Yeah. Taking taking agency, Greet said, is a perfect way to say it. Alan. Old fashioned waving of the hand. I like it. I get that. I can see it. Well, oh, sorry, Tom's also good. I thought I'd try a low tech thing. <laughs> it's probably, I'll probably see you more if you do that. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to sort of back up what Krista was saying. Um, no, I, I recognise that people need to do you know, their, own, their own work, and which is very, very important in, in lots of ways. So it's very important when it comes to action as well, because if you don't do your own work, as has been said a number of times in the film, Films, and you've said this as well, Katie, is that people tend to project their shadows, so then it becomes very much us versus them, which is, <coughs> you know, that, and that it doesn't take us anywhere, it doesn't take us forward. But I just want to make, to say, make on, on, on sort of the, the point that, um, that uh, but ultimately, um, the inner work leads us to realise that we don't, on a, on a deeper level, actually exist. <laughs> And that actually we are all just part of the consciousness and that we're all just part of the oneness. And, and that um, is, a, I think, is an important message when it also comes to um, social action, because the more that the more that more people realise that we're all part of the oneness, the, the more that um, you know, extinction of species and climate change is likely to be tackled. Because when pe if people stay stuck in their the egoic illusion humanity hasn't really got a you know a, a very long road to, to carry on on not in the way it is at the moment anyway so i just wanted to say back up chris's point actually 
inner work's really important, but so is outer work. Because, and ultimately, mm -hmm. the inner work leads us to realise that we are actually on a deeper level, just an illusion anyway. So, yeah. anyway, someone to make that point. <laughs> no, that's it's a really important point, Alan, and it brings us nicely into, um, into just quick mentioning our third film, The Vision. Um, because I think, yeah, when something that I kind of really like to advocate is the fact that, you know, through this awakening process is that's like we, yeah, there's this kind of responsibility to move from egocentrism to like through ethnocentrism, to cosmocentrism. It's like real, this realisation that we are part of the greater whole. And exactly like you said, Alan, to sort of realize if we are at one with nature then we need to start taking much better care of nature and um we are nature i was, I was listening to a brilliant um podcast by philosopher philip goff on panpsychism the other day about how consciousness is fundamental to everything and um if, if we realize that we are we are consciousness kind of evolving itself it's like we have a responsibility to become become that as a species is, is to become that evolutionary process um samir would you like to say anything about the vision sorry i was going to say does tom have his hand up oh sorry sorry tom uh, that's okay yeah. um i come from a background of um 12-step recovery and um that is um, living or trying to live a spiritual way of life. So, you know, I, I've um, had my inner journey and part of that is uh, helping other people. So, you know, you're, you're in a circle and um, you're walking alongside other people that are, are recovering you, and you help each other. And, um, that's what I've, I've picked up from this evening is maybe that's um no i don't know of any other group like yourselves um i've, I've copied the chat or saved the chat i didn't know that there was um you know the the, the groups or the website so I'll, I'll go and have a look I, i'm in merseyside so i don't know if there's any groups near me that i can get involved in but that's the sort of thing that I'm I'm looking for, is um, where we can um, sit and talk like this, um, because I know for myself that I I, I have grown spiritually, that um, I'm consciousness, and that um, I have to act on my intuition. Um, forgiveness, love, and healing are, are part of what I need to contribute on a daily basis to people around me. And, and that's, that's what happens, you know, the synchronicity of, um, of throwing that out into the collective field, then people will be put in my, in my path that, can, that I can help and they help me. Uh, and and that's, that's been my experience. So, I know that um, the pandemic for me has been a great thing because I did an awful lot of meditation with people uh, internationally. That's how I came across Julian and the um, European Caravan of Unity and, and that sort of thing. Um, Mom it was uh, the organisation I came through to get onto this. So mm. I know that um, I just need to be involved. It's finding out where the little groups are locally. Is yeah. the thing next. Thank you, Tom. I'm just noticing the time. Um, just to let you know, there is an, I love 12 step and there is actually a spiritual emergence anonymous now. It's been set up, um, set up, um, it's an online group, it's international, but spiritual emergence anonymous um, dot org, I think it is a brilliant 12 step program for uh, spiritual emergence so if you're feeling alone and you want some more of these groups then that's a great one um so a minute ago samir did you want to say anything about the vision and then we'll hand back to krista uh yeah so basically um we hope to make uh more films or specifically we have one film 
want to make called the vision. Um, as Katie mentioned earlier on, it's taking these ideas and looking at what would happen if we actually had a, these ideas. Um, there are two sides of it. One side is about social change and political activism, ac activism and models for the future. And the other side is about internal models. So consciousness, conscious evolution, the nature of our consciousness. Uh, and the, the, the relationship is, is one is about our internal energetic system and the other is about the external energetic system, so the social systems. And uh, we've done a number of interviews and um, yeah, please just stay in touch and, and sign up on the website for, for news and uh, further information. Thank you. Yeah, please. I've just put the link in the chat. Please do sign up. They're all free to watch. So please share, share the films around. We just want them to help as many people as possible. That's, that's the idea. And if you are able to contribute, that's always helpful. <laughs> Krista, thank you. I'll hand back to you. It always goes so quickly when everyone starts to talk. <laughs> it does. And thanks to everybody who is still there. And I'm so really pleased that we could uh, show you and that uh, the films tonight and that Samia and Katie were here um, to be with us. So thank you to everybody who came along. Um, so we are Sacred Earth activists and quite a few of you will know us. Uh, we have a website and also quite a big Facebook group. We do both. We do action, direct action. We are involved in the change movement, so we are bringing ceremony, spirituality, drumming, God knows what, uh, into different actions. Uh, we were very heavily involved in Stonehenge, uh, the infrastructure development. We are right now involved in Right to Rome. We are involved in XR. But we also, what we really do is we combine the spiritual with an earth-centered spirituality with concrete uh, action. So look us up, Sacred Earth Activism. Um, three words, .org, we have a website and quite a big Facebook group. But that's not what this is about. This was about Samia uh, and Katie, and I have seen them now the third time, and I am always, again, touched. Uh, by them and thank you ever so much Samir for making them and Katie for being well hey instrumental I would guess uh, in making them and thanks everybody for the being here oh yeah we of earth talks uh, this is part of our earth talk series so we uh, watch out for them uh, we had the head of the laws for rivers uh, on an earth talk uh, a few weeks ago so uh, there's some interesting stuff coming up it's usually free it's not quite as beautiful as it was tonight so <laughs> the films I mean. <laughs> that's all from me katie samir do you want to say anything as a last word just thank you krista and thank you everyone for joining and it's always really nice to see people's reactions to, to the film so thank you yeah thank you so much for being here everyone and and for engaging it's so helpful when everyone's it's so engaging so really appreciate that um lots of love to you all go well <laughs> please sign up <laughs> good to see everyone thank you thank you, thank you. bye, bye.